For Dads in the Six, I'm Nicholas Mazzeo. And I'm Jamie Campbell. Uh, hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. <laughs> good, good, good. Good, good, good. So I wanted to talk about today a uh, little history lesson of... So I was born here in uh, Toronto, Canada. That's why I'm a dad in the six. But my parents are from Uruguay, in South America. So I grew up... Their dad's uh, Jewish. Yeah. Which is also technically a race. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but anyways. But uh, he's, he's from Uruguay. So I grew up kind of ingrained in that culture and all that stuff. So... Soccer's huge. Holy it's, shit. Are we starting in 1901? Yeah. Technically in like 1900 or something. Strap in. Um, but anyways, essentially, soccer's what we do along with other things. Like, See, it's, it's, it's a shame we don't have Jesus here because he would be the counterbalance to Uruguay being from Argentina. It's like Canada, USA. For Very, a second, I thought you meant Jesus Christ. It's a shame we don't have him here as well. But, um, but no, uh, pretty much, essentially... Uruguay, Argentina, very similar to, I would say, the relationship that Argent- that Canada and USA have. Culturally very similar countries, but rivals, things that one would say, no, that's what we do better, and then blah, blah, blah. So anyways, soccer is kind of like our thing. Mm-hmm. With the World Cup, the 2018 World Cup, showing up in about less than three months. So I want to give you and our listeners a little history lesson on the Uruguayan national team. Reason four is because I, there's a lot of interesting history here. I don't know how interesting I'm going to make it to you because I feel like this is, can almost be like a journalistic sort of piece, and that's not me. For what it's worth, I'm still going to be impressed because imagine me giving you a lesson on Canada. I'd fail horribly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so by default, you're going to do better. Okay, I appreciate that. You know, we, we can essentially just jump in because I, I, I think this is interesting. I'm biased, obviously. So take everything I say with a little grain of salt here. But pretty much, actually, funny enough, the day we're recording this, I think two or three days ago was the anniversary of the, the I, I can't think of the English word, the founding of the Uruguayan National Soccer Association. So Ooh. it's like 118 years old. So how, it started in how appropriate. 1900. Uh, so right from the go, 1901 pretty much Argentina and Uruguay they're neighboring countries so logistically back then before they had I think airplanes or whatever they started playing against each other kind of neighboring countries no other countries if I'm not I'm pretty sure up until this very day no two other countries have played each other more than Uruguay and Argentina so you take into the early 1900s before there was really an organized World Cup or anything I was gonna ask when FIFA was uh first World Cup was in 1930 so 1901 Argentina and Uruguay played each other. So that was kind of the first time they played. No two other countries have played each other more. And yeah, so obviously they would just play a lot. A lot of the tournaments they would play against each other would be like these sponsored sort of like mini tournaments by Lipton, actually, who's like that. You might have heard of them. They make teas and maybe soups. I don't know. Because the English obviously brought football to many parts of the world. The English brought football to Uruguay. So by like something by like the 1920s, Uruguay and Argentina had already played each other 80 times, more than 80 times. By 1910, so actually even before this, Argentina organized the first unofficial South American championship. So Argentina won that one, but it's considered unofficial. So it doesn't really count in the amount that they've won. Uh, With a smirk on your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 1916, the first official South American championship comes along, and that's where Uruguay wins. So the South American championship, which is now, you know, it's called the Copa America, is is the, the continental tournament, you know, like the Euro Cup. Right. So the, the Copa America is a, and it's very important. It means a lot to Uruguay. It means a lot to countries like Argentina and, and Brazil as such. It's like it's like home pride. It's like home pride. Right. It's I mean, and, and it's as big of a cup you could win without winning the World Cup. Right. Right. For a, for a, for a national team. So so back and forth, Uruguay and Argentina keep picking up a couple Copa Americas here and there. Brazil. See, this is the thing. A lot of people you ask now, it's oh Brazil, Argentina. Right. South America, soccer, it's those countries. Uruguay has shades. Like I think people can pick if you're if you follow soccer somewhat, you could you could say, okay, you could recognize Uruguay, you could understand the history. But back then, actually, no one talked about Brazil. Brazil didn't exist. Brazil existed as a country, did not exist in the soccer realm, in the soccer world. So um, essentially the style of play was was very different than what Brazil ended up bringing in. But you had Argentina, Uruguay doing their thing. So 1924 comes along. 
this is where things start picking up now. This is where things start kind of like, all right, bigger gr- global stage. So FIFA wasn't quite FIFA yet in the sense of like they weren't organizing their own World Cups, but there was the 1924 Olympics. So FIFA says, hold on, hold on. I know you guys do like a soccer thing, a tournament. We're going to step in and it's technically going to be like the FIFA World Cup within your Olympics. Okay. <clears throat> so whoever wins this Olympic gold medal is technically the FIFA World Champions. So obviously at this time, it, it wasn't about qualifying. It was just like whoever can sail over, <laughs> feel free to show up. Um so Uruguay kind of put some money together and sent a team via boat. 1924 Olympics, which were in uh, France or Paris or something like that. So they show up. Kind I'm of picturing here like an entire soccer team hopping on some and you got to think ocean faring ship here just to go to the World Cup. That's kind of epic. Yeah, and that's that's what they did, right? And, uh, and that's not a short journey. No, and I I would assume like even think I would assume even Canadian athletes going to those Olympics must have just hopped on a boat, right? Yeah, like, I never thought of that. How else are you gonna get there? And so, what's so? This is where some of like the lore, the mythos of of Uruguay as a country starts developing. They couldn't really organize like hotel proper hotel accommodations, so most of the team ends up staying with kind of like this. And I w- I could have googled her name, maybe I should or could have. This friendly old lady, and she just says, "You can, I guess, stay with me." And I I forget the details of like how that occurs, but they end up staying at some French lady's house during the tournament so right off the bat it's kind of like an interesting dynamic they get there and it's interesting uruguay like i said back and forth with argentina winning a couple Copa americas but i guess because they didn't know how to internet back then uruguay shows up to europe and everyone's like ah whatever right like don't worry about them this is these are a bunch of south americans they don't really know what's going on europe is the king of soccer there were some typical powerhouses but not all of them that you would know today is different generation right like no one worries about it Uruguay's first training session their first opponent was Yugoslavia which doesn't exist today as a country but Yugoslavia sends um, spies to their training camp Uruguay finds out that there's spies there so what Uruguay does the whole training camp they start ruining their they start kicking balls into the air they start like tripping over themselves that's hilarious so then Yugoslavia and reports back like these guys are garbage. They don't know what they're doing. Maybe they win shit back in South America, but that's because they play baby soccer over there. Don't worry, but this is a joke. We got this back to business as usual, right? We're European. Uruguay, U- Yugoslavia play the first match. Uruguay beats them 7 nothing. So Nice. They probably killed their spies. <laughs> yeah. like you brought that. And so what Uruguay initially did there, though, is they brought a new type of football to... Um, to Europe and hence the world um, because what was traditional back then was like essentially like the long ball. You kind of boot it up field, you figure it out and you got there. Uruguay, what they did was a ground game, like a passing game. Like you're no more than five feet away. I pass it to you. And it's a very methodical Short. sort of thing. Everyone assumed, you know, cause that, cause that's kind of like the English way of playing, especially back then. So they thought that's what would happen. So they arrived to Europe completely unknown. Um, and then after that, that seven nothing uh, victory, Uruguay ended up going on to essentially dominate the whole tournament and win. I think they ended up playing Switzerland in the final. Argentina wasn't there, but they uh, ended up beating Switzerland in the final. So this is where again the mythos of Uruguay continues to grow, and their relationship with France. So the French, who were so impressed with Uruguay and their uh, their soccer, it's considered essentially the most important match in the development of French football to this day because they saw what Uruguay did and said, okay, we need to do that. This is how we need to develop our soccer system and ideology. So essentially a lot of it goes into maybe where you see France today. So much so that Zinedine Zidane, um, he's, do you remember the World Cup 20, 2006? He headbutted the Italian dude, yeah, that yeah. guy. He's current manager of Real Madrid. Um, he his one of his favorite soccer players is Uruguayan. He named his kid after that. Like there's just like kind of like this, this brotherly maybe love. sort of brotherhood. Yeah, essentially. And what was also interesting about this is Uruguay had a black player, um, which was back then unheard of. Countries like France, I don't want to I don't want to name drop just in case I'm wrong, but like you know other like Ita- like Italy, they wouldn't like allow black people on their soccer team. 
Uruguay had no problem with this. They the, he was essentially like the first what they would think assume one of the first big global black soccer icons. Even he was probably considered the first sex sporting icon, like the first person that women lusted after and like people would go watch Uruguay to see him because he was like a superstar. He essentially was given the nickname that Pele, the greatest soccer player ever, ended up inheriting from him. Um, his his name's Jose Andrade. He ended up uh, essentially living like the rock and roll lifestyle. He ended up dying in like his 50s or 60s, pretty much, I think, alone, borderline homeless, poor. I forget where, if it was in France or back in Uruguay, and like of syphilis. <laughs> he essentially like rose and then drove right down. So long story short. And what was his name? Jose Andrade. Hmm. 1928 rolls around. Olympics are back four years later. FIFA does the same thing. Let us host our world championship within your tournament. This time it's in um, Amsterdam. And uh, Argentina makes it to this one. Argentina decides to come along. Argentina, Uruguay, naturally because they've grown up playing the same soccer style together that's revolutionizing the world at this point, they meet each other in the final. Uruguay beats Argentina. Close to 250,000 tickets were like requested. Like This was the best of the world now, which is kind of surprising. At this point, they've already played over 100 times. Uh, Uruguay ends up beating. So now they have two world championships. At this point, uh, FIFA says, all right, no more Olympics. We're hosting our own thing. Uruguay, you've won the last two FIFA world championships. You are given the privilege of hosting the first World Cup. So that's how Uruguay ended up with the first World Cup. And at that point, Uruguay like cobbled together what at that time was, I think, the largest stadium in South America in like a year. They cobbled. It wasn't actually even ready for the first few games. Like they were still Sounds like every Olympics. Yeah. Sounds like every Olympics major tournament. So because of this, because there was also like issues of like racism and stuff like that, like a lot of European only four European countries came. A lot of European countries boycotted this world, uh, the first uh, FIFA World Cup. Um, like they didn't feel like it was legitimate or... Yeah, and they're just like, well, why is it in South America? It should be in Europe. Right. Out of Europe was France, Belgium, Yugoslavia, and Romania, which on a European standpoint sounds like a weak lineup. But again, if you look at historically, those were actually some of the stronger footballing nations back then. Like it wasn't always about Germany or England or Italy and stuff like that. And at this point, Brazil, non-existent. No one, no one's talking really about. What are they doing? Like beach volleyball or something? Yeah, probably. They they do dominate that sport. So again, Uruguay Argentina meet once again in the final. Uruguay comes back from behind, ends up beating Argentina four two. Third championship, hat trick of championships, if you will, ladies and gentlemen. So this was so intense. This was this is again the rivalry between Argentina and Uruguay. That after that, Argentina broke off international relationships with Uruguay for a period of time. Like they just said, we we don't like you. So we're not doing business with you. And at that point, honestly, Argentina really spends like the next 30 years, like kind of just irrelevant. Like they don't actually end up doing anything until, I mean, they win a couple Copa Americas over the next few decades, but they really don't win their first World Cup until 1978. Okay. So I know you have, I know we're only on the third championship, but yeah. the tattoo on your wrist, there's four stars there. Are you counting those three in those four stars? Yeah. Okay. So this is when you argue with Jesus often about the legitimacy of Uruguay's four world championships. He, he, in his defense, calls into question the first two quote unquote fake championships. Yeah. And then he may also bring up the fact that a lot of good European teams weren't at the first World Cup. Mm-hmm. So he might, that's how he might try to throw you off, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so my, my counter argument to this to this imaginary jesus who's who's no longer on this podcast yeah. would be uruguay went to the first two olympics which were FIFA, like fifa was an organ a recognized organization yeah, yeah. sponsored essentially the olympic tournament and said a you get a gold medal but b you're also a fifa world championship yeah. so the legitimacy can't really be argued like it is recognized and acknowledged they, they're not just sewing two extra stars on their crest now do they count when they when they refer to FIFA's now, you know Super Bowl is like Super Bowl fifty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they're even that high yet. Yeah. Um, do they call World Cups by that, or is it just by the year? It's uh, so like that first World Cup in Uruguay in twenty nineteen thirty nineteen thirty yeah. was that world the first World Cup? Yeah, they yeah. no they never said World Cup one, oh, okay. World Cup two. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually it's like World Cup Uruguay. You the the 
World Cup Brazil, like kind of like typically where it's hosted. Okay. Um, you, you can continue. Yeah. No, good questions. Good questions. And so my other further county argument is so not all these European countries came. Actually, only 13 countries came to this World Cup. And it wasn't because, again, this was still like the infancy of the tournament. So they weren't they were just trying to cobble together teams here. Like they weren't bothering with like, oh, you got to qualify to make it. You're just like, please just come. Yeah. Uh, Uruguay actually was so desperate to get more countries that Uruguay paid the accommodations and travel for, a lo- for I think, most or some- a lot of these nations to just be like, just come, we'll pay. And so that's how they got a few countries. And then a few South America. I think USA. USA actually played the first ever World Cup match, I think, against France. Okay. Uh, and Uruguay, I think USA even made it to the semifinal, but th- 13 countries. Uruguay ends up winning this World Cup. Big festivities. Everyone loves it. So anyways, oh, sorry, sorry. My final counter argument to Jesus' point is the fact that Uruguay went to the previous two Olympics and beat Europe's best. So like... Yeah, too bad Argentina you weren't there. Too bad you weren't there and all... Well, you were there for one, you got your ass kicked. And then, you know, they were in Europe dominating, doing the tours. So anyways, that comes along. So that's what happens now is that now you have the 1934 World Cup, which gets brought to Italy, that Italy hosts. Uruguay says, no, we're not going. So you boycotted us, especially Italy. Uh, we're not going to your World Cup. And so I can now argue the legitimacy of Italy winning that World Cup because you didn't actually beat the best. You didn't have the three hat trick champions. You guys didn't defend your, your we, title. We chose there. not to defend it there. 1938 World Cup shows up. That's hosted in somewhere else, uh, France, I think. Um, Uruguay boycotted that one because they said, no, FIFA promised that every other World Cup would alternate. Europe, South America. Europe, South. FIFA said, "Ah, sorry, we're doing it in France." You boycotted eight years of, of World Cups. That's, like, that's an entire generation of players. Potentially could have had two more stars there. Like there, you could make a strong argument that they could have come in there and won those next. Yeah, I, just, two World I Cups. hate, I hate the fact though that eight years was wasted off of like good players' as lives, and that's why like I hate when the NHL, yeah, how they don't send the players to the Olympics, like. Your next opportunity is four years later. Like the next time you get to see Crosby play with McDavid, Crosby's not getting any younger. Like yeah, he's still he's still in his prime. But yeah. next Olympics, he's gonna be four years older. Like yeah, he you're missing won't. out on this like McDavid's of Austin Matthews going Olympics. Will that ever happen? It had didn't. This was, would have been his first year. Yeah, so. and he doesn't make it. So then uh, World War Two happens. So essentially, there's no World Cup from 1938 until 1950. 1950 shows up. FIFA says, okay, Brazil. You can host the World Cup. Brazil hosts. So Uruguay didn't go to a World Cup basically from like 1930 to 1950. There's like a 20-year gap yeah, there. Yeah, Crazy. and there was like two or three World Cups that I guess weren't happening because of the World War. So Uruguay goes to this World Cup in 1950. And at this point, Brazil has started to rise a little bit. Uh, Uruguay had, or Brazil had won the previous Copa America like the year before. And at this point, they had a really strong team. Now, uh, was Uruguay still winning Copa Americas at all in that period? Good question. I don't know if some of those might have also have been canceled due to the World War, um, what, you know, during the 40s and stuff. So I don't, though technically Brazil won one in 1949, but, you know, the World War was over by then. 1950 kind of comes along. And so at this point, Brazil are strong favorites. Again, I wasn't around. I don't know what necessarily makes Brazil the strongest favorite, but they were. And so Uruguay makes it to the final. Actually, I lie. This World Cup's all crazy. It's like you play in groups and then you qualify into a final. I think it was like a four or six team like bracket. Like you just go in and literally all Brazil had to do to win the World Cup was to just tie Uruguay because it was just the points. It's like at the end, it's like a mini little league. Um, This is how they're figuring their shit out in these World Cups still back then. So all Brazil needed was a draw and they would beat Uruguay needed to beat Brazil in order to (laughs) finish above them in the group so over two hundred thousand people are packed into like this massive stadium called the maracana it was one nothing brazil one one uruguay and at that point brazil's like all right we can squeak by with this draw uh and then with about i think 11 minutes to go uruguay scores the go-ahead goal ends up winning fourth world championship two world cups two olympic gold medals four world championships four stars so they haven't won since 1950 this is like some maple leaf shit going on right this now. is some some maple leaf shit going on so they haven't won since 1950 but it was amazing because again the mythos and this is this see i feel like i'm not doing it justice because we're also on a, like a tighter time frame sort of podcast here but this is again where the mythos grows brazil tell me what color jersey do they wear green yellow 
Yellow. Okay. Uh, you were cl- they, yeah, they can't wear green green accents. But yeah, yellow. I think everyone knows that. Brazil was wearing white jerseys back then. This defeat hurt them so bad. 200,000 people were silent. Like the people have gone on record of saying like it was actually dead silent in a stadium that big. Uh, they changed their jersey color from then on. They said, "No, we can't do this anymore. We can't wear white. This is horrible." Um, they were. That's how big of a favorite they were expected. They had already pre-printed the next day's newspapers with saying Brazil champions. Uh, that they ended up throwing up, making a contest, be like, "Someone make us a new jersey," and that's where the yellow comes from. So you, every time you see Brazil wearing yellow, it's because they're Uruguay's bitches. They're wearing yellow now, um, thanks to Uruguay. And at this point, Uruguay ends up winning the trophy. And going from there. So Brazil still no world championship. And so from then on, a couple more World Cups happen. Uh, I got, I'm trying to just breeze through this. Uh, so a couple more World Cups happen, you know, in and out. Brazil, I think Uruguay makes a couple more semifinal appearances. I think Brazil are, finally wins one. I think about 1970, Uruguay makes a nice little run to the semifinals, actually loses to Brazil. Uh, and I think Brazil goes on to win that one. Uh, after that, though... That's when Uruguay enters its dark ages. They just wanna put me down, put me down, but I'm a Hey guys, Nick here. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, or wherever you're listening from. And if you're feeling extra kind, drop us a comment or a five-star review. They go a long way to helping our little podcast grow and get noticed. Also, check us out at Dads in the Six on Instagram or Twitter, where you can keep up to date on show schedules, information, and just our general day-to-day lives. Now, let's jump back into this week's episode. All right, we're back. So, this is actually, you notice I have a notepad. I've stopped from here. (laughs) So, from 1970 to 2018, I'm going to wing it for you. And I'm going to try and speed it up along a little bit because, again, I wasn't born. Uh, so from there not actually, th- so that was the, fr- I think probably one of the last times Uruguay, Uruguay beat a European country in a world cup was 1970. And from then on, Uruguay kind of enters this sort of, they make a couple world cups here. They start missing world cups here. Like, cause at this point they've, they've started like introducing qualification. So you have to play obviously, uh, games within your continent and to try and qualify. And at that point it was smaller tournaments. So it was like only like two, maybe three countries from South America. So it's tough competition. So at that point, Uruguay misses a few world cups. The 1980s gets ugly. Like I think they actually 1986 world cup. I think there's like an infamous match where, uh, Uruguay plays Scotland and I can't even remember if they win or lose, but dirty game. Like I think there was about like a thousand red cards, um, Uruguay are essentially called like the thugs of football. And that's kind of like a moniker they've carried from pretty much then and almost until now. And only recently they've started kind of shedding that off a little bit. Cause you have to think a lot of what attributes to Uruguay's success is what's called like the Gara, the Gara Charua. I'm like Englishing that, like I'm, I'm saying it like that. Uh, essentially what that means is like the fight and the Charua is like a uh, indigenous people. First Nations people who lived in Uruguay who no longer exist. They've they've been all, unfortunately, killed off. Uh, they they kind of like honor their fighting spirit that they had, and they've, they've said that. But what happens is that fighting spirit now becomes like this dirty, like people see it as like they're dirty. It's like this, this physical fighting spirit instead of like the heart and soul that Uruguay went to win f- four world championships. So the Dark Ages come, and they start missing World Cups left and right. They were actually strong in 1990, end up getting bounced by Italy in the first knockout stage. Um, we would have been in elementary school, right? Full of Italians back then? Yeah. 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 Who probably hopefully didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> um, so at this point, they start getting bounced. I think they miss 1994 World Cup. They miss 1998 World Cup. And then they make the 2002 World Cup. So they make the 2002. And this is where I come on board. So around the year 2000, uh, my dad has taken me to a bunch of soccer games at this point, like here in Canada, to go watch on screens and places. But again, sports in general weren't really interesting me and all this stuff. But something about this the first game of qualification to the 2002 World Cup, which was hosted in Korea, Japan, it's Uruguay versus Bolivia. Bolivia is a pretty not good soccer country. We should have crushed them. Uruguay ends up winning just one nothing. I think our best player at the time even misses a penalty kick. So you were at this game? 
not at the, like I was watching this game in Toronto, like on a bit other uh, club, okay, full of other Uruguayans here in Toronto. Over on Wilson? Uh, no, this might have been the club Uruguayan mm. in Woodbridge. Have you seen the national Uruguayan team ever play in person? Yeah, once. Where in, was that? In uh, 2009 in Uruguay, uh, they got trounced by Brazil for nothing. Um, and that was actually the first time Brazil had beaten us at home in 33 years. I was at that game. That's uh, tough. That's tough. My grandfather took me to that game. Did he cry? No. He was just pretty pissed off. Um, so anyways, I remember watching that game and just like something from there on, just like hearing that roar of like just, I don't know, the 50 or so people in that room i'm like i was hooked and i was like i'm in so watching every game pretty much from then on in we end up qualifying by the skin of our teeth we end up finishing in fifth place fifth place is like the playoff spot in south america you got to play like australia we beat australia we qual i lose my voice i remember i had a presentation the next day in like history class i couldn't talk because my voice was gone uh, and i'm like this is it i was in anyways long story short this is, again, that fighting spirit about Uruguay that I start kind of getting attached to. I'm like, there's just something epic. And there's something about the history that, for me, I would have loved if you could say Uruguay had won a, at least a World Cup or two after 1950. Because the, the joke is, if you want to pick on someone from Uruguay, it's just like, oh, last you won a World Cup was when, like, dinosaurs were around. I can relate so much. But. Yeah, as a Leaf fan, I think, especially a lot of people listening to this probably can, can relate. Exactly. And so... Grant, I would have loved, but there's something about history. And to me, what Uruguay has taught me is that history counts for something. So, like, when you put on the jersey, it's, again, I'm biased, you could say that, but, like, there's something heavy about the jersey. There's something meaningful about the jersey. And, like, there's a good story about uh, this player who was formerly one of our captains. When he just started on the team, he got out of the change room and, you know, halftime or whatever. So he just took off his jersey to get a new one or whatever and puts it on the floor. And the other guy stopped him and said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? He's like, I'm changing. He's like, no, that, that shirt. And I think they were even losing. Like it was, Everyone just felt like she was like, no, it doesn't matter. You don't put that jersey on the floor. There's just something, There's a, again, a mythos. There's a, there's a heaviness. There's a weight to the jersey. And so for me, um, I, just something about that just hooked me in. Um, and so 2006, they play off against Australia. Again, lose that time. So that fucking hurt. After that, this is where we get our new coach. And now he's been the longest serving coach, I think, of any country. He's been our coach since 2007, okay. which is unheard of in the international stage. Um, and sorry to interrupt, where was the, what year was it when, I think it was the year we were going to Vegas, I yeah. think, because we had planned a Vegas trip sitting in that Uruguayan bakery and we watched a game there that year or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That 2006? Yeah. No, that's 2009. 2006, we were like 20 years old. We didn't go to Vegas. 2009, because you were getting married in 2010, we went to Vegas in 2010. Yeah, 2009, uh, we watched the playoff game. Because again, Uruguay once again, for the third World Cup in a row, finishes in fifth place in South America. A playoff game, a home and away against Costa Rica. And that was the one where one of your players was in like the box and stopped it with his hand or something, right? No, that's... that's <laughs> My memory fails me. That's in the 2000, the fault that... The World Cup they qualified then for the 2010. So as I consider that probably like one of the best games I ever saw, 2010 Uruguay versus Ghana quarterfinal of the World Cup. Oh yeah, Ghana because down where we watched literally it was, around the corner is like Ghana town. Yeah, and around the other corner is like Uruguay town. Yeah, I don't know where I, why I was in this situation, but it was uh, okay. It was fun. It, luckily, no one got hurt. Um, and you have to think the weight of that because that was the World Cup hosted in South Africa. And at that point, the only African country left was Ghana. So essentially, like, it was Uruguay versus Africa. Africa. And essentially, Uruguay versus the world because no one cares about a country with only 3 million people. That's the other thing I even get to. This country has 3 million people. Like, there's, there's countries that have more registered soccer players than Uruguay has just people. Right. And this is a country that has now gone on to win 15 Copa Americas, the most of any. Argentina has 14. Brazil has eight. It's Brazil. Um, this is a country with uh, three million, three and a half million people, produces just as many foreign exports of soccer players as Brazil and Argentina do. Hmm. Um, so that's kind of like the level, the quality. Now, it hasn't been consistent up until maybe the last 10 years. Um, so again, I, that match, like we're always the underdogs. 
we're always we're never playing like this beautiful game like Brazil does or Germany does or even Argentina does sometimes. So no one likes watching Uruguay either. And that's the thing. No one no one chooses to get on the bandwagon because like oh I do, man. You do, you do, and because you get it, you get it. You've been watching the Leafs for a while. Um, you got to like know what that means to kind of jump in. And I think th- that's a good analogy. I never thought coming into this is like to be a Leaf fan is almost to be very much a Uruguay national team fan. Um, there's something about it's like, that jersey. It's just blind. It's it's blind uh, dedication. Yeah, but it, it's but there's something honorable in knowing that it's built on something whether rather than being blindly dedicated to like i don't know the, the arizona coyotes yeah or know. something <laughs> las vegas knights like all right they're cool but like they're winning a lot. they're winning a lot um so there's just something about the mythos and the fight and and it's just there and they're definitely party ruiners like even going back to uh, 1924 they showed up and beat you seven nothing because you underestimated them they showed up to brazil uh, clear underdogs ended up silencing an entire country. Um, they show up to the World Cup in Africa and silence that entire continent. And again, they 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 drew the ire of everybody because that's where Suarez used the handball to stop it. The 120th minute of extra time, last kick of the game, and he stops it with his hand. And then you had the pe- they had the penalty. They kick, had the penalty, and then you stopped the penalty. Kick. And if man, this I could do a whole podcast on that penalty kick and that whole situation because for me, everyone's like, "Oh, they're cheaters." No, you're not cheating. You used you you used what's within, within the, the confines rule. of the game. Yeah, There's yeah. a very specific chapter in the rule book about handballs. He did it, got a red card, paid the paid, paid the, the price. price Got a penalty kick, and I think what pissed people off is when he missed. Uruguay uh, Suarez was still walking off to the change room. He started like celebrating, and so we're like, "Oh, that's not sports." I'm like, "F that." Yeah. yeah. Um, no NHL. I mean, I hate to bring it back to the NHL. Yeah, that's but cool. The guy's on a breakaway. You trip him. Professional foul. He gets a penalty shot. It's a like, pro- it's sometimes you got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. It's not like he pulled out a baseball bat. They do they do intentional fouls in the NBA all the time. Like yeah. that's that's a strategy. Yeah, and then you hope that he misses his free throws. Yeah, and, and you that's... you stop the clock and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, so I I've always hated kind of the Suarez hate. You can hate him for a lot of other things, but I hated the hate he gets for that handball. Because for me, I would have done. You would have done the same thing in the hundred and twentieth minute of a quarterfinal World Cup. I would have thrown my firstborn in there. Yeah, yeah. been like, get that ball out of here. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I don't know if we're near the end of your your main stuff here, but what's are we looking towards the future here? What's what's upcoming for Uruguay? So yeah, yeah. Let's let's go to that. I mean, again, I could I could spend multiple podcasts going on Uruguay, but I just want people to with this upcoming World Cup, give give them a look. Give them a look. What I'm happy here is um, our coach has been horrible for the last five years, but literally the last four games in our qualifying stage to get us to the World Cup, we finally qualified without finishing in fifth place, which is nice. Um, He's finally introduced youth. He's had the same aging players forever. So really, he's introduced a new midfield, which is fantastic. These like 20... Max is like a 25 year old in there, and so they're they're exciting. They're actually playing possession based football, which I haven't seen in the last 20 years. Um, they're kind of like the dark horse. They have a relatively weak group. There's a good expectation that Uruguay could finish first, but then they might end up facing Spain or Portugal. Um, but anyways, I don't know. Keep them a look. If you like the underdog, support Uruguay. If you like kind of the the never give up sort of attitude, I would say watch Uruguay because Uruguay could be losing three nothing. And most countries would be like, uh, oh, well, it's over. At least Uruguay will come back to their dirty roots and they'll at least break your leg. They'll be <laughs> like, you know what, we're taking you out. We're gonna hurt you. They'll make it interesting. Um, so if you like kind of seeing that fighting spirit, and then even when they're the passion they have, I think, behind the shirt is very unrivaled to what maybe other countries, other players or other teams who wear who represent their country. Well, I'm a fan. That's all I want to say. I want to wrap that up with the World Cup upcoming. So um no Canada's in it, but maybe next time. But Probably for not. now, if you're just Canadian, you got no team to root for, try Uruguay. Don't don't go for the easy ones, the Brazils, the Germanys. Try Uruguay. Hashtag try Uruguay. <laughs> Hashtag try Uruguay. <laughs> See you guys next time. See ya. Dads in the Six is hosted by Jamie Campbell and me, Nicholas Mazale. We're produced and edited by Jamie Campbell. Our theme song is Nobody Speak by DJ Shadow and Run the Jewels. All of our other music is by Antonio Di Gregorio. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you all next week.